Hey everyone, welcome to International Family Church. So glad you could join us. Let's all stand up and pray Je praise Jesus together. When I'm in the roughest waters, I won't go under, I won't drown. When I'm in over my head, I know that you I'm broken and I'm to nothing. I know that you are always up to something good. I know that you are always up to something good. You make a way, whatever.
whatever the fire is that is in our lives right now, Father God, let there come gold out of that season. Father God, we thank you that you are refining us, perfecting every single thing that concerns us right here in your presence. And we will never leave it the same because we find every single thing that we need right here, right here in your presence. We thank you for revival breaking out all over this room, right on the inside of us. We thank you for new life in the name of Jesus. We thank you for renewed hope in the name of Jesus. We thank you for families restored in the name of Jesus right here, right now, because of your presence, because of your glory. We just thank you, Jesus, for what you are doing in and through us. We will never be the same because we've encountered the presence of a father. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you for this moment that we get to have in your presence. What a privilege it is to just get to sit in your presence. We love you. We thank you for the word that is about to come forth. We are ready to receive it. We thank you. We pray these things in Jesus' name and say, amen. Come on, let's give God a shout of praise. He's so worthy. He's so good. He's so good. He's so worthy. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for your goodness. Woo! I am so excited to be in the house of God today. Thank you so much for worshiping with us. Before you take a seat, please greet a few people in your area. Let them know it's so good to see them this morning. and I want to welcome you to International Family Church. We're so glad that you joined us for church today. Here at IFC, our hope is to give you a place where you can experience a fresh, enjoyable connection to God and a community of people to do life with. As your church family, we want to stay connected with you and most importantly, be able to pray for your specific needs. The best way to do that is with our Connect Card. You can fill out the Connect Card in the seat back in front of you and drop it off at the hub in the lobby or if you're joining us online, grab your phone and text IFC Connect to 77977 to get started. We're honored to be your church family and we look forward to connecting with you. If you'd like to learn more about who we are as a church, we would love for you to join us today for the IFC Growth Track. Today, after each service, we'll be having step three of our four-part weekly growth track designed to help you grow in your relationship with God connect with the church and reach your full potential. God has put leadership potential inside of every person. Leadership is not about titles or positions. It's about people discovering their gifts and passions and then using them to make a difference in the lives of others. If you want to know more about how you can grow in your personal leadership, then join us today for step three of Next Steps. You can join us today after each service in the Next Steps room on the first floor lobby. We've had a great family month so far. There's a few more events coming up that we'd love for you to be a part of, starting with our next Youth Summer Night event this Wednesday, here at IFC at 6.30 p.m. Water Balloon Wars is coming this Wednesday, and if you have a student entering grade six and up this fall, we'd love to see them there. Come ready to have fun, get wet, and of course, eat lots of pizza. The cost is $5, and you can register at intlfamilychurch.com or the IFC app. Gentlemen, coming up on Saturday, July 24th, we're having a men's night out here at IFC starting at 6 p.m. We'll have food, cornhole, hatchet throwing, a mechanical bull, and a hot dog eating contest. The cost is $20 per person and is for ages 13 and up. Register today at intlfamilychurch.com or the IFC app. We're continuing our mandate of having the courage to pioneer by focusing on having the courage to pioneer a lifestyle of prayer. Having a lifestyle of prayer draws us closer to God and keeps us spiritually sensitive to His will for our lives. We'll be setting aside time to focus on corporate prayer together. 
Next week, July 26th to 30th, join Pastor Tom live on Google Meet for a time of prayer and impartation at 6.30 a.m. and noon. We'll finish off the week next Friday, July 30th, with family prayer at 7.30 p.m. here at IFC. The Google Meet link, the prayer schedule for the year, and other information about corporate prayer is available at intlfamilychurch.com and the IFC app. We look forward to you joining us next week as we pioneer a lifestyle of prayer together. Church, how's everybody doing today? Turn to your neighbor and say, you look good. So exciting seeing all of our family come home. We've been scattered, but I want to tell you, if you're just coming back to IFC, we want to welcome you home. And for, for all of our guests today, that's our treat to you, just saying, welcome home, make yourself at home. Whatever we can do to serve you, we're here for that. I want to invite you to continue worshiping God with us as we honor Him in our giving. And if you're online, there's tons of ways you can give online. We'll put those on the screen for you. And right here in the auditorium on the back of your seats, there's an envelope. I was thinking this morning about our vacation. We just returned from a family vacation where we spent a week with my father and our extended family. But I forgot something about my dad, and that is my dad loves to tip everybody. He loves to tip the bellboy at the hotel. He tips the drive through lady at McDonald's. I mean, he's tipping everybody, and he's always encouraged us, leave a great tip. And it is a good thing that we should tip those that are in the service industry. Amen? What a great witness. But I thought about this in this morning in preparing. You know, I wonder if that's how some people treat God in our giving. That we tip him when we come in this time of the service because, hey, I had a great week, Lord. Thanks for a great week. Here you go. Hey, thanks for another great week coming up. Here's a little bit for you, Lord. And I want to remind you that this isn't just a time of tipping. This is a time of honoring God and actually worshiping God. There's a story in the New Testament of Jesus, and he's going to the town of Bethany where his friend Lazarus has just died. And Mary meets him at the city gate, and she said, if you could have just been here yesterday. And he said, I'm here today. And she said, you could have, you could have saved him. And he tells her, he said, chill out. Everything's going to be fine. He's going to live again. And she said, I know in the great resurrection, he'll be risen, you know, in eternity with us. And he said, no, no, no. He said, I am the resurrection. And you know the rest of the story. He called Lazarus forth. And that next night, they're celebrating. He's at the dinner table with Lazarus. And here comes Mary with a box of ointment. And it says that she poured out the ointment that she was going to use to cover her brother's dead body and, and begin to rub her hair and wash his feet as a sacrifice of honor and worship. And the Bible says that Judas was the one that said, she's wasting this. Lord, what is she doing? And he said, let her be. She's worshiping with her substance today. And I want to remind you that this is a time where we honor God, not for what he's done, but for who he is in our life. The Bible says where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. This is a great time when we tell the Lord, hey, our treasure's in your house because our heart is with you because we know your heart is with us. Amen? Father, we thank you for this great opportunity to worship you. Lord, we honor you in the tithe. We return our tithe back to you, giving you back 10%, knowing you're going to honor and bless and multiply the 90%. Today, we ask you to take our seed and send it around the world to let everybody know about the love of Jesus that we've encountered. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Pastor Josh. It's good to have you all in God's house today. It's good to see everyone. And I tell you what, I'm loving seeing people that have been back, uh, haven't been back for a long time and welcome back again. It's good to see you. Can we say again a big a round of applause for all the family, one by one coming back. If you're here in the auditorium or joining us online, uh, my name is Jonathan Del Turco and I'm the lead pastor of International Family Church. And I personally want to welcome you along with my wife to welcome you to being here if you're in the auditorium or joining us live online. Man, we've been looking forward to this day so much. We are so excited that this day has finally come. Uh, we have, we have uh, learned, we valued, we have been in a great place where we have been drawing on the gift that is about to stand before you today. Uh, Dr. Caroline Leaf is a 
is a communication pathologist and a neuroscientist. Can you believe we have a neuroscientist in church this morning uh, that's going to minister to us today, uh, which you're going to be pretty amazed by. 30 years, over 30 years of research and study that has helped the world understand the mind-brain connection and the nature of mental health. And you know, all that we've been through over the last 15 months, emotionally and mentally, I guess her visit is probably uh, well-timed, wouldn't you agree? Her visit is well-timed here today. And uh, whether or not you're uh, in, whatever you're dealing with, I believe that today is a day where I believe the principles you're about to hear are gonna produce hope in your life. Isn't it great to go to church where hope is alive? Well, we just don't come to church and talk about the problem, that we come to church and give you solutions, give you hope, help you understand that there's, there's, there's something we can do to improve our lives and to bring freedom into our lives. And whether you're here or a, a loved one dealing with many issues, uh, such as painful or traumatic uh, issues to um, anxiety, depression, or repetitive or intrusive thoughts, you're about to learn something that I believe is going to radically change your life. I'm so excited today to be able to present to you our very special guests. And would you please stand with me and let's honor the gift of God um, and give a warm IFC family welcome, please, to this incredible gift, Dr. Caroline Leaf. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. You may be seated. Well, I'm Big Mac, and I've been married to the brain for 33 years. I'm the subject of most of the books and the DVDs out there. I guess you're all alive. We've been talking about the live hope, and I was going to bring in some death. Just remind me of a pastor down the road from you who took his dog to a vet, and he said, something's wrong with my dog. And the vet looked at the dog and said, the dog is dead. He said, how do you know? So I've been practicing so many years, I can tell a dead dog. He says, no, I want a second opinion. He says, okay, it's going to cost you $100. He says, I'll take it. So he whistles in the back, in comes the Labrador, sniffs the dog, and then he opens the cupboard, pulls out a cat, holds it on top of the dog and puts the cat back in the cupboard. He says, your dog is dead. He says, how do you know? He says, we just did a CAT scan and a lab report. That's a dead dog. <laughs> We do have a few bundles on the books, a special book, two of Dr. Leaf's letters books, um, Cleaning Up Your Mental Mess, 101 Ways to Get Less Stress, selling for $30, save yourself $12. I'll be selling books outside and I'll be managing the slide. So from Texas, bless your all, as they say. <laughs> I think that... I think you can guess by our accents, we're definitely not from Texas, although we've been living there for a few years. We're from South Africa. Mac was actually born in Kenya and I was born in Zimbabwe. And we, <laughs> so we, and we grew up in South Africa and we've been in the States for 13 years and we travel everywhere teaching people about the mind and the brain in churches, conferences, education, neuroscience conferences, I train physicians around the world. So we're very privileged to do this. And, um, this is, I still do clinical trials, still do research. I don't practice clinically anymore, but I did practice as a clinical neuroscientist for 25 years. And now I try and put everything into books and my app and to try and help people to manage their mental health. And the reason I'm so passionate about this is because you drive your mind and your mind is the power that drives your brain and your body. So if your mind is a mess, everything else in your life is a mess. And you can go to church, you can read all the great books, you can listen to everything that's great to listen to to help you manage. But if you're not managing your mind, you're not gonna be able to apply that stuff. So it's vital that we understand what the mind is and how to manage it. And one of the things that the mind is not is the mind is not your brain. So I have a brain over here and this, oops, there goes my toxic tree, which I'll pick up in a moment. But you are not your brain. Thank you, Pastor. <laughs> your brain is not you, you control your brain. You're not a victim of your biology, you're a victor over and above your biology. Brain is vitally important, but your brain without you, your mind, can do nothing. So if I had a dead brain in my hands, if I had a dead person on the stage and this was their brain, 
the brain wouldn't do anything. But because your brain, you're alive, your mind is working, if we link you up to brain technology, we would see evidence of your mind in action in your brain. And I'm stressing this because it is with your mind that you experience life. So here you are in church, so you're in an environment, there's people all around you, I'm speaking, you experiencing this experience with your mind. So your mind is literally a gravitational field, a, a, a electromagnetic field generating photons around you, through you, and in you. When a person is dead, they don't have that activity. And we'll see slides as we're going through this presentation and this talk this morning of this. So this is not anything weird. If you're scared of the word energy, then you don't believe in, you're scared of God. Because where do you think God, where the source, any source of energy comes from? It's from God. If you don't like energy, don't use a cell phone. Don't come to church, don't switch on the lights, don't eat, don't drive a car. All of that's energy. Don't go to the doctor, don't get an x-ray. Do you understand what I'm saying? You've got to be very careful of being religious and thinking, oh, energy is a bad word, or science is a bad word, or if you're scientist, you can't be spiritual. And we were having this discussion in the green room, so I'm going to just start by saying that science, and I'm a scientist, comes from the word sclera, which, sclera, which means knowledge, and who is the source of all knowledge? God. So science is so spiritual. In fact, I've had some of my most spiritual moments studying science and studying my field of science, because what you see there is the magnificence of creation and the incredible power of the universe. And you see how things work, and it's magnificent, our bodies and life, etc. So science is helping us understand that. Your kids at school are learning science. Science is not just science. Science is also biology and geography and, and everything, how, how flowers grow, anything. How a, a, how a cell phone works, how clothes are made, all of that is science, it's knowledge, okay? So it's really important. So the, I am going to talk to you today about your mind, your brain, your body, the link between the three, and I'm gonna use science to do that, and I'm gonna link that into spiritual principles because the Bible is the story and science tells us how the story works. A couple more things about science is that science and religion tell the same story in two different languages. Okay? And scientists and, sp and, people that, that, and people that are spiritual you often use different vocabularies to describe the exact same mysteries of the universe. Okay? And so that's what I'm going to do today. I'm going to use two languages, the language of scripture and the language of science to explain mystery and the mystery of the mind and the mystery of the brain and the interaction between the mind, brain, and body, which in science we call psychoneurobiology. And it is a mystery, it's an incredible mystery that we're learning about, but it's something that God has given us. So the conflict between science and scripture are completely um, are unnecessary because we're really talking about two sides of the same coin, and it's very often over semantics, not substance. So we can get so caught up in arguments over the words that are used and language, and we need to be a little bit more open to hearing different things. Otherwise, we learn, we lose a lot in life. Okay, so that applies to so many different things. Okay, so the first slide I'm going to show you is just the title of the talk, um, Cleaning Up Your Mental Mess, the title of my book, the title of my podcast, and it is literally the most freeing concept because what I'm going to tell you now is that it's okay to be a mess. It's really okay. In fact, you, you, you're made to be a mess. It's part of who you are. There isn't anyone who isn't messy. It's a beautiful gift from God because messiness allows us to repair and grow. If you don't make a mess, you can't repair and grow. If God wanted robots, God would have created robots. You're not a robot. You're a free thinking, brilliant human being who can think and feel and choose in an incredibly unique way. So with your beautiful mind, that is how you experience life, you are thinking, feeling, and choosing. So when we talk about mind, we're talking about the power of being able to think and feel and choose. So if you want a definition of mind, mind is how you think, feel, and choose. Those three things. It's like a little triad. When you think, you feel. When you think and feel, you choose. You can't think without feeling. You can't feel without thinking. You can't think and feel without choosing. You can't choose without thinking and feeling. All of that is mind in action. And you're doing that all day long and all night long. During the day, you consciously and deliberately thinking and feeling and choosing in response to every experience that you have from the moment you open your eyes till the moment you go to sleep. And you will have around about, on average, 8,000 to 10,000 experiences in a day. 
And every one of those experiences you think, feel, and choose about, and as you're thinking, feeling, and choosing, that is energy that you're creating, and you're taking that and you're putting that into your brain. And then your brain re re reacts to this mind stuff by electromagnetically and neurochemically and genetically and builds the stuff into little trees in your brain. So right now at 400 billion actions plus per second, you are taking my words and the images that you're seeing on the screen and everything in the environment that you're experiencing and you are converting it through your mind into your brain as trees inside of your brain. You're growing little trees in your brain. You genetically, I mean, you are in a genesis moment. You are in a, in a growth moment. You are creating at the moment. You have been given the power of God to physically change the structure of your brain and your genes every moment of every day. Isn't that incredible? And what's even more incredible is that this power that drives the brain, the physical brain and body is in your control and you've been given the freedom to have this and you can access wisdom or not as you drive your mind, as you drive your brain and your body with your mind. So in other words, you have the ability to drive your brain and body in the direction you want with or without wisdom. You can access the wisdom of God and the wisdom that is inside of you or you can stay in a mess. So in order to find wisdom, you have to make a mess because it's all experimental and then in the mess you find the wisdom. But you can stay a mess and stay angry, frustrated, irritated, overwhelmed, burnt out, unhappy, bitter, victim, feeling a victim all the time, blaming everyone else, um, having a, you can stay there if you want to, but as you will all know, who've, you've all been there at certain points in our life, it's not a great place to be. And your body starts suffering because you're this, that, all that stuff I've just described is going through your brain and your body and coming out through your mouth and the actions you perform. So it's this funnel, mind, brain, body, action. What you say and what you do, and if it's messy mind processing response, then it's messy brain and body, messy action or words, and then the cycle keeps going on. It's a feedback loop. But you're not a victim to that. You, you are able to look at that and say, this is a mess. I don't like this. I want to change this. And that's the power of capturing a thought bringing all thoughts into captivity. You've read that scripture and said it a million times. In every ancient text, there is some reference to us being able to capture thoughts and control them and renew them. So in other words, listen to the scripture. It says, bring all, not just the thoughts you feel like bringing, all thoughts. So what is a thought? A thought is the product of the mind. So the mind is your thinking, feeling, choosing, and how you experience life. And with your mind, you, your, your mind is how you experience it, and the stuff that you are experiencing goes in your brain and gets built into a thought. So a thought is the product of the mind, so, and you make them. You build thoughts. That is your creative power, and that means you're changing your brain. And to change your brain means that is basically means that your brain is neuro. Plastic. Neuro means brain. Plastic means to change. You have the power to change your brain. Your brain is never the same because your mind is always having new experiences. You're always having new experiences, which means that your brain is always changing. But the quality of that change is determined by how you're managing your mind. So mind management is, in essence, capturing thoughts and renewing the mind. So renewing the mind is mind management. And how do you do it? You've got to capture the thought and you've got to renew it. So we say the scripture, how do you do it? And it doesn't mean that you use God as a genie and scripture as a band-aid. So here's the problem in your life. Memorize 20 scriptures, bang it on like a band-aid and wonder why your life's still a mess. Okay? And then, you know, God didn't show up. The devil's attacking me. So now you take all, you know, then you blame the devil. I thought the devil was defeated. Okay? So why are we giving energy in the wrong direction? Okay, and why are we blaming? We've got to look at, and we don't, have to, we don't have to feel bad either about ourselves because it's okay to make a mess. You are, in essence, a scientist. And as a scientist, you are hypothesizing about what's coming up next. You may not have consciously used these words, but you are. You, don't, you can't control the events and circumstances of life, nor can you control the people in your life as much as you'd like to. I mean, we'd love to control what our children do and our pe people around us do, but you can't. And you're not supposed to. You're only supposed to control yourself, okay? And you're supposed to support others, 
all right? So in other words, if you can't control the events and circumstances, everything is actually a thing that you are hypothesizing about. So every conversation, someone says something to you, you don't quite know what they're saying or what their intentions are, and you don't know what the full thing is that they're saying, but so it's all hypotheses, you're waiting for the data, and then once you have the data, you can then make a determined response. Do you hear what I'm saying? And it's all in the moment. And yes, there's a certain amount of prediction we can have. You can get to know a person and you can, there's certain, you get knowledge and you get experience and all of that is stored in thought trees in your brain, healthy ones. And as the person is saying those things to you or you're reading that email or you're in that meeting, these are coming up. Your, your thoughts, which are real trees in your brain made of proteins with all these branches, are coming up to help you with the current upcoming discussion that you're in. In other words, as, as, you, as I'm talking to you now, you're hearing words, you're seeing images. These are, these are sound waves and electromagnetic waves. And psychologically, it's you're hearing words and you're seeing pictures. That's all mind stuff. It's all this big mind stuff. That then goes through your brain. And you are building my words into your brain, into little proteins, vibrations inside proteins that group together to form a tree. And you are growing my words into your tree, into my words into trees in your brain as we are speaking. Now the roots of the tree in this pot are the words that I'm saying and the things you're seeing, so the source. And the branches are how you uniquely interpret what I'm saying. So not one single person here will have the same branches. You'll have the same roots because it's this origin as you're listening to my words. So, the, But the way you are understanding me is unique to you, how you uniquely think, feel, and choose, and, and your unique life experiences. Because as I'm speaking, not only are you hearing, but a whole bunch of thoughts are popping up into your mind. Mental health, anxiety, depression, experiences, that person said this, that. All kinds of thoughts are popping in and out of your mind at the moment from your non-conscious mind into your conscious mind to help you make sense of what I'm saying. And that's all this mind stuff. And you build about, you have, you have about 8,000 to 10,000 experiences in any one day, and you convert 8,000 to 10,000 experiences into 8,000 to 10,000 thought trees in your brain per day. And then as you're building those, you're, in, you're being informed by 10 or 20 or 30 every few seconds. So there could be 20, 30,000, 50,000 things going through your head in any one day. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> and if that's not organized, and it's not managed, you can get completely overwhelmed and burnt out. And then you start reacting instead of responding. Okay? So, what happens to you is not the same, does not have to be the same as what happens in you. So there's life, and there's all the experiences of life. You're not an individual alone. You are a human in life. You're in an environment. And whatever your environment is, you're experiencing. And there's people in your environment. So the people and the circumstances of your environment are what you take in through your mind into your brain and how you are then expressing yourself. So you are responding in your environment. You're not isolated. So if you are feeling very depressed, that is not that you have a broken brain or a brain disease. You, don't, you aren't mentally unhealthy. You are battling with your mind um, depression is a signal that there's something going on in you because of your environment, because of what's happening in your environment or what happened in the past that hasn't been dealt with. So everything about you, listen to this very carefully, is made in God's image. You are made in God's image. So you are literally wired for love. Love is survival. So we see neurobiologically, your brain and your body, there isn't a single structure or organ or system in your brain or body wired for toxicity or for things that will break you down, for anger, fear, all those things, condemnation, all those things, evil, murder, fighting, gossip. You're not wired for that. You don't have fear in your brain waiting to jump out. You don't have depression in your brain waiting to jump out at you. You don't have anxiety in your brain waiting to jump out of you. There isn't a neurobiological correlate for something bad in your brain waiting to explode. And that's the message that we get given in mental health today, and it's an incorrect message. It's not at all scientific. Your brain is affected by your mind because your mind works through your brain. So if your mind is messy, then your brain builds a toxic thought 
So the proteins, instead of folding nicely, fold incorrectly. And then the chemicals don't flow correctly in the right quantities. I'm really simplifying a complex process. So you land up with a very distorted version of the experience. So for example, if you are in, like you're in church now and I'm telling you stuff that's important, so this would be a healthy tree. But let's say that you experience an abuse. You, maybe you were bullied as a child or you were abused as a child or you were abused as an adult or you had, I don't know, something happened. We've all got trauma. Trauma is very much part of our life. Big, small, complex, different levels of trauma. That would look like this. It would be distorted. The roots would be the experience, all the experience, the sensations, the words, the emotions, the physical sensations, all that's in the root. Then the processing is through the tree trunk and the branches at the top here is all the data of how you interpret that situation. The easiest way to understand that is someone who's a sexual abuse survivor, they, the sexual abuse, all the detail, the emotions, the a toxic touch, everything would be in the root system and the processing into this part would be how they, how that person then interprets themselves, how they think, feel and choose about the situation. And, and, and it's an initially a coping, a coping mechanism so you have a trauma response and generally, and I'll use the sexual survivor example as because as, as it's the easiest to understand because it's the most extreme, one of the most extreme, is that generally a sexual abuse survivor will interpret themselves as bad, as um, not valuable, as a wor not worthy. Um, so they blame themselves because everything's, everything's distorted. Um, and that can persist into adulthood where they hate themselves and that can then manifest in all kinds of behavioral issues and increased levels of, of depression and anxiety, which are not diseases. Depression's not a disease. You cannot have clinical depression. You cannot have depression. It's not an it. It is a signal. It is a warning signal. It is a messenger. Any emotion is not an it. It's a warning signal that God has given us to enable us to be able to recognize that there's something that needs attention in your life. So it's drawing you like an alarm wakes you up in the morning. Depression is an alarm saying there's something going on in your life that needs to be addressed. There's a toxic issue that is unmanaged and it, and it needs to be addressed. Have you ever caught yourself saying things like thoughts weigh me down? My thoughts are weighing me down. Have you ever felt like you put your head in your hands and felt this is just too much for me? Like you almost feel like you have to hold your head. These things physically are heavier because they're more distorted than a healthy thought. They look different in the brain. We'll see a couple of Im Im examples further on in, in, in this, um, as I talk. So look at this next slide. Have you ever said things like, I need to gather my thoughts? Where things just feel like it's out of control. I had a day like that on Friday where there was just, just too much going on. And I'm really good about teaching people to balance their lives and I did not do it on Friday. So I made such a mess, but thank goodness I am trained to recognize the mess and I'm 80% more effective. My research shows that when you manage your mind, you can be 80% more effective in managing, in just managing what's going on in your life. So I saw it and it hit me at five, it was about five, it was actually 5.40. I remember the time I was thinking, I, my head, uh, it's too, my thoughts are t entangled up. I'm overwhelmed, my brain is tired, my mind's still going crazy. I need to gather my thoughts and my mind is a whirlwind of emotions. Literally, I need to, and not my tangled thoughts. I mean, this looks like a tangled thought. Uh, my thoughts are weighing me down. My brain is tired. My mind won't stop. So I got my two little puppies. I went and sat outside with these two little shih tzu puppies. If you follow me on social media, you'll see all my pictures of these two cute puppies. Um, one looks like a monkey. It's uh, supposed to be a shih tzu, but we don't quite know what else this little dog is. It looks like a monkey. Um, and I sat outside, had something to eat, and I just played with the dogs and sat there in the sun and re and re you know, calmed myself down and then managed to sort of sort out the day and process. And that's... That's an example, but this is a reality. We, we, thoughts are real. So I had a lot of experiences that day that were things that I had to deal with, work stuff and emotional stuff and this stuff and that stuff, and it was just boom, 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 bad planning, that, and it, just, it accumulated. So I had to stop and gather my thoughts and start calming down and sorting out what I'm going to do and so I could process and move forward. And that's what all of us can do. If I didn't do that, I would have gone from there into the next thing, into traveling, into this, into that, and get overwhelmed and burnt out. How many people are burnt out and overwhelmed and feeling just they can't deal with life? You know, suicides are increasing, and suicides come from people that are, I've worked with suicide victims, suicide survivors and families of suicides. And suicide is a lack of hope, a lack of, someone once described it to me, it's like standing on a 20-foot building. 
and there's a fire behind you and there's 24, which one are you going to choose? You know, jumping off is not the best option, but going in the flames, what do you do? You're stuck in a, and there's like no hope. When people's identity is attacked, when they feel that they have no value, when because who they are and what they believe is not valued by the tribe or whatever, and they lose hope in themselves, or someone said so many times to you that you're useless or, or whatever, that you can't do this, or you know, you've had these things spoken over you and you feel like you aren't valued, where's the hope? When people lose hope, they want to die. They want it to end. They don't really want to die. They just want that pain of not being valued to go away. And those are all thoughts. Those are experiences. When these accumulate and accumulate and accumulate and accumulate, and that's all you see is this. You overwhelm with that. You lose hope. The other day, someone was interviewing me about divorce and said, what is it? why is it so hard? And when you love someone at the beginning of that marriage, it's just like this wonderful excitement. And then suddenly, 10 years later, there's all this horrible, terrible sadness and thoughts. And so said that one, think of the green tree in the middle as the healthy thought, and then think of all the toxic experiences that have been happening that, that haven't been managed, building around. So eventually this is drowned out by this forest of toxic trees. And you have to disentangle, you have to, those are producing all these signals. And when we know what the signals are, we can start going from the signals and untangling this web and finding this again, whatever that looks like, whether it's the marriage being saved or whether it's maybe better for people to be apart and to start again because of whatever. There's no cookie-cutter solution. We've got to stop being so judgmental. We've got to start valuing people for who they are. We've got to stop putting rules and laws on people. And, uh, and taking one belief system from one religion and one culture and imposing that on everyone else. That's not love. We had a long discussion about love in the green room. Love is your wiring. It is your mental, physical wiring. On the psychological level, you are wired for optimism, wired for love. On the brain and body level, you are wired for love, as I've said. So when people are drawn to toxic things like the news, when the news is so negative or people watch like someone who's, um, who's doing terrible things and you watch a movie about that, we're not drawn to, to evil or dark stuff because we are dark and evil or have that side of us. No, guys, you're wired for love. We're drawn to that because it's imbalanced. We want to restore the balance. So we're drawn to the negative to restore the balance. We see that as a warning signal. The problem is, is that if we don't know how to control the process, if you're not managing it, and then you're drawn and you're drawn and then you build these toxic forests and they control your thinking. So whatever you think about the most grows. So if you're drawn to that, your initial drawing to that is to restore balance because it threatens survival. If your love is threatened, survival is threatened. But if you get sucked in and you just keep thinking about that and thinking about that, it grows and grows and grows and grows and grows, and that then consumes and you look at life, this, is, this becomes your perspective. And that's where things start really breaking down mentally and physically. And we start seeing very toxic behavior patterns. But at any point, no matter what you have done or what you have experienced, you can change what's in you. You can change what's in you. I've taught this in maximum security prisons where I've had over a thousand people in front of me that have been murderers and done the most shocking things. And, and within two, and, and we were telling the story earlier on to, the, to your pastors that there was a, a, a metal room behind me and I had two security guards on the side of me and they said, if there's a riot or anything, we will literally pick you up and put you in there and lock you in there for safety. That is how dangerous it was in that environment. Not one single person was not on their knees crying within a few minutes. For three hours, I was in there teaching this message. These men were on their knees crying with this message. Not one person wasn't. So in other words, when you talk love, you generate love. And when you own your mess, you can fix it. But if you think, okay, I'm on the stage, I mustn't own my mess, I must pretend that I'm okay, you're lying to yourself and you're not giving permission for the people in your audience to manage your mental health or in your environment. Only 3% of leaders are talking about their mental health because they're too scared to, because we've stigmatized it. Listen, we're all battling with our mental health. There isn't one person in this room who is exempt from battling with their mental health. Every single one of us have and will experience anxiety, depression, frustration, irritation, guilt, complaining, you name it, to different degrees at different times. And guys, that's okay. The big thing is that you need to own it and realize that because you wired for love, that is not who you are. You're just showing up like that in the moment for a reason. What is the reason? Why are you showing up in that state? Let's 
embrace it, let's process it, let's reconceptualize it, let's deconstruct and reconstruct. And that is capturing the thought and renewing the mind. And this is what we should be doing all day long because it says to capture your thoughts, all your thoughts, all 8,000 to 10,000 thoughts you're building are supposed to be being monitored while they're being built because that's what renewing your mind is and capturing your thought is as you're thinking, feeling and choosing and building that thought, which you're doing now, you're supposed to be connecting to wisdom, which is God and the wisdom that is in you and saying, okay, how do I do this? What's the impact of my words on myself? How am I feeling emotionally and physically? What's it doing to that person I'm speaking to? This sounds like a lot of work, but you can do this very quickly because you're brilliant. Because if it says bring all thoughts into captivity, then you are designed to do that. If it says pray continuously, which is pretty much what I'm telling you to do, which is if you're constantly monitoring what you're thinking, feeling, choosing, which means what you're saying and doing and your impact on the world and changing that, you're praying. Because you're using, you're looking at yourself and what you're producing in the world, how you're communicating, you're tracking back to what you, to the thought, tracking back to how you got that thought in the first place. You're measuring up against love. God is love. Therefore, what are you doing? Guys, you're praying. Amen. So prayer in church or on your own or for a specific instance is a prayer, is a booster shot. It's not the whole story. The whole story is doing this continuously. This is the challenge I put out to everyone who hears me. Whether you believe in God or not, whatever religion you are, I talk across the board to everyone. I say the same thing to everyone. We are supposed to be monitoring our thoughts. So as a scientist, I want to see, can we do this? Is the science there for this? It is. We can manage our thoughts every 10 seconds. The science is there. The evidence in neuroscience and quantum physics and the research in psychoneurobiology shows that as humans, you can stand back and you can observe your own thinking, feeling and choosing in action and the impact in action and change it. So from here, try that, even try it now. As you're listening to me, monitor yourself, observe yourself, how you're responding, how you're sitting, how you're breathing, what's going on in your head, what thoughts are coming up. When you go from this conversation, go and, and, and you're talking to your, your loved ones or whatever, over lunch or something, monitor yourself, how are you using your language? What is, what's the impact of your language? Is your body language saying something that's maybe making them, if someone is reacting to you and saying, hey, whoa, calm down. And you say, don't tell me to calm down. I mean, that's one of the worst things to say to anyone, anyone. But you know, this body language and this tone and those words, monitor that. Say, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said calm down. I'm sorry I used that body language. I'm a little irritated at the moment because of. I'm showing up irritated because of. I'm gonna fix that. Sorry that it impacted you. That's so much more real than just carrying on snapping and arguing and fighting. In any one day, in any one day, if you think of life as a number line, remember what a number line is. It starts at zero and it goes from one to 10 on the one side. This is just a small number line, okay? And it goes from zero, minus one to minus 10 on the other side. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine a line with zero in the middle? And one to 10 and minus one to minus 10. I use this example often. If you've ever heard me say this before, forgive me for saying it again, but it's so easy to visualize and help you understand what I'm about to say. Now imagine that there's a bell curve going from minus four to plus four, okay? In any one day, our average life swings between minus four and plus four. Minus four is waking up complaining or being miserable during the day or feeling kind of sad or depressed or getting really anxious about something and, and kind of getting it together and, and then something good happens and you swing to a plus four and then, you, then something else happens and you swing to a minus two and then something else great happens and you plus four, plus five, plus six and then you're just like exhausted because you did too much like I was on Friday and I swung down to a minus four and that's okay. Own it. And then in that minus four stage, you maybe snap and get ugly and, and say something or gossip in a nasty way because gossip is not all bad. There's good and bad gossip, but you do bad gossip. And I threw a lot out there in one sentence. And own it. Oh, gosh, I shouldn't have said that. That wasn't very nice. That was own it. Because then you're managing it. That's so healthy. You are, when you own something, you don't cause brain damage. But when you keep it and you pretend it's not there and you try and hide it, you cause brain damage. And when you cause brain damage, you cause dam damage to your genes. And when you cause damage to your genes and your brain, collectively, it obviously means your mind is damaged. So the three places, psycho, neurobiology, mind, brain, body, all become damaged through your mind choice. So with your mind, you damage your mind. With your mind, you damage your brain. With your mind, you damage your body. And if you keep on doing it and you don't 
deal with those traumas of the past and you just keep pushing them down every time they're triggered, you are increasing your vulnerability to disease by 35 to 98%. So on day one, it may only be a 1% vulnerability, but for 10 years later or five years later, you're sitting at a 35 to 45 to whatever percent vulnerability. What does that mean? Well, there's now a virus out there, Greater, you've got a 35% chance now of getting the virus. Meanwhile, if you dealt with your stuff, you had a 1% chance. I mean, this is what we are seeing now in this current advanced, medically, technologically advanced age. For years, people have been dying longer. That trend of people, I mean, living longer, sorry, dying here longer, Be living longer. But for the first time in decades, that trend has reversed. People, the trend of people living longer has reversed. People are dying eight to 25 years younger than they did years ago in this advanced age. In other words, what does that mean? That means if you are in the age bracket of 25 to 65 year old, there's a good chance you are going to die somewhere eight to 25 years younger than what you should. And your children and your grandchildren, Gen Z and younger, are going to be even worse off, off the, the, the predictions are showing. It doesn't matter how advanced, technolo technology is advancing and medicine is advancing. Why is this happening? People are dying eight to 25 younger, years younger from preventable lifestyle issues. Preventable. What this means is that people are dying younger because they're not managing their minds. If you don't manage your mind, you won't care what's happening. You're gonna increase this vulnerability in your body. If you constantly are not managing those traumas from the past, you're constantly living in a mess. I showed with my most recent clinical trials that some of my subjects came in at that state. Their body was, the organs of their body were of a 30, were 30 to 35 years older than their actual age and they were sickly. So here they they were in their 30s, for example, but their body was of a sickly 65 year old. They are going to die 15 to 30, 8 to 30, 25 years younger if they don't do something about their mind. Within nine weeks, that completely reversed. Within nine weeks, that person, those subjects in my clinical trial that had that kind of pattern, by nine, within nine weeks, and nine weeks is a very, very, a very, very important number, 63 days of mind management, that had completely reversed. They were, their body, their chronological and biological ages had matched. In other words, there was no medication involved, there was no diet involved, there was no exercise. Not that I'm saying you mustn't exercise and eat healthy, you must. But I was just looking at mind management first. Just through pure mind management, people went from being suicidal and a body that was so sick that they were vulnerable to dying up to 25, 25 years younger than they should, to normalizing and stabilizing and reversing that statistics. And that was purely through mind. And I tell you this to tell you, that's why I do the science that I do, is to give you the data and the evidence of your powerful mind that you can reverse these things. You do not have to be vulnerable to these things. You do not have to die younger. You do not have to live a life that is filled with, with a trauma constantly. I mean, unmanaged trauma. You're going to always have trauma. Sorry, let me say that again. You will always have trauma because you don't know what someone's going to do. Okay, someone who you trust could send you a terrible email, a family member could turn on you, a friend could turn on you, your boss could fire you. Trauma's coming. Don't even try and kid yourself, okay? So you've got to know how to manage it. You've got to be pro preemptive and proactive. You've got to recognize you will have the minus fours in your life and you will have the minus threes. And sometimes it just gets too much and the minus four accumulates and you're stuck there for two weeks, three weeks, one month, three years and you don't deal with these traumas that you know you should be dealing with and now suddenly you're in minus five, minus six, minus seven and you're getting these mood swings and you're getting these hallucinations and you're getting disassociations and you're getting all these scary words and now you're being told you've got a disease or clinical depression. Meanwhile, that's not what you have. You don't have a broken brain. You are beautiful. You are amazing. But life has happened and life has impacted you, and you need help managing it. You need your story to be told. You don't need to be told that you have an it. You need to be heard. You need to be able to embrace and process through identifying the signals. You need the support of your community. You need that therapy. You need that counseling. You need that coaching. You need that support from your loved ones. But they can't do it for you. They can only support you. So mental health is something that we're all battling with. I don't even want to say the word mental illness because it has such a terrible stigma. The last 40 years, there's been such an emphasis on the brain and your brain's broken and mental illness that it's contributed to that terrible statistic I just gave you of people dying 8 to 25 years younger. I want you to look at yourself differently. I want you to say, it's okay to be a mess. It's okay to be sad, depressed, anxious. It's okay to slip into the minus four, but it's not okay to stay there. You've got to manage that. You've got to access the wisdom of your wired for love nature 
and change that. So now have a look at another couple of slides here. You, I, over the last 38 years, have been spending hours of my life and weeks and days and months and years trying to find how do we do this stuff that I'm telling you. And I started initially with very extreme cases with people with traumatic brain injuries and dementias and extremely severe learning disabilities and um, ex ex suffering from very bad stuff, like sexual trauma and war trauma and really severe stuff. And I was like, let me try and see if I can work out a way to help them get into their wise mind to be able to fix this mess because you're not all this. So if you've had a trauma, that's not who you are. That's what's happened to you. It's a part of what's happened to you, okay? And you can change that, because you can't change what's happened to you, but you can change what's in you. What most of us don't realize is that we can change what's in you. We don't realize, because you're not being told that. So I'm telling you, as a scientist, you can change what's in you. And that's totally scriptural, because God says, capture the thought and renew your mind, which is what you're doing. You're choosing life, not death, when you do this. It's really hard. It's really difficult, it's not gonna be easy, but it's something that you can do if you know how. So the NeuroCycle is a system that I developed. Mac, if we can just get that slide back up. We NeuroCycle to drive neuroplasticity. Neuro means brain, a cycle means to move through stages. And so what I wanted to find out was how can I get my mind, my wise mind to work with my messy mind in order to be able to drive these changes. In other words, to capture this and to change the wiring in my brain. Because this is wiring in my brain. I want to change these. So your brain, the, the fact that your brain can change is called neuroplasticity. The fact that you can neurocycle means that you can actually drive the neuroplasticity. So in other words, you can capture this thought and renew your mind. That is, in science terms, you, how do you do that? You use the neurocycle to capture the thought and renew your mind. And all of that together is mind management. So we can do that, we've got that power. Okay, so now I'm gonna build this up and help you understand this. So, uh, Mac, if you can just get NeuroCycle to drive neuroplasticity, that slide for me. Okay, um, so let me just get, yeah, this is the right one. So if the, if the wired for love system of the brain becomes disturbed, the slide's gonna come up in a moment. Um, this, and this goes unmanaged, this leads to warning signals like anxiety to warn us to pay attention to make a change. So that's basically what I've just said. So this disturbs, the natural functioning of the brain and the body and the mind. Now this is a thought, it's a real thing as I've said, it's made of proteins. I explained how as you're listening to me now, you're converting all my words and whatever into little proteins in your brain. You're not building a toxic thought right now, I hope. You're building a healthy thought, okay? So this one is healthy, this one is distorted. So your immune system of your brain and your body will reject this and will send out immune factors to fight it to try and get rid of it. So this is as real as something like the COVID virus or any bacteria or any virus. So thoughts are real things that occupy mental real estate, exactly like the COVID virus occupied bodily real estate. You get this? Yeah. People don't, I mean, you get this that a thought's real and that your immune system says, hey, threat to survival, I've got to do something about this. It then, the way you've been designed is your mind, brain and body work together to warn you. It sends you warning signals, okay? So if the wide for love system of the brain is disturbed, and this goes unmanaged, this leads to warning signals. Now, what are those warning signals? The warning, there's four categories of warning signals. The first one is emotional, and all this is in detail in my latest book, Cleaning Up a Mental Mess. I also have an app called The NeuroCycle, which also, I literally give you therapy, I walk you through the process. Okay, so the first signal is emotional. Things like anxiety, depression, frustration, panic attacks, combination of, there's a whole list of emotional warning signals in the book, there's a, and there's a little scale and everything to help you identify them. But that's your first category of warning signals. So when you're feeling depression, this is the NeuroCycle app. When you're feeling anxiety, when you, those are not its, you're not a broken brain, you're not mentally ill, you're not crazy, okay? You are just battling with something that's going on in your life. And you've got to tell yourself, this is okay. I embrace this as a helpful messenger, and when I embrace it as a helpful messenger, because this is not me, this is telling me something that's going on in my life. Versus, oh, I've got clinical depression. What do I do? I've got to take a drug the rest of my life. No, you don't have to. If you are feeling depression, it's not an it. It's not like cancer or diabetes at all. Those are completely different constructs. When you're feeling depression, it is a warning signal that something's going on. And research shows that when you, instead of looking at depression as a bad disease, 
and you look at it um, as a warning signal that's a helpful messenger that's difficult but that you're going to embrace, you're going to bring into your fold, you then become empowered to control it. You shift the power of balance. In seconds of saying, okay, depression, I'm not, I don't like it, but I see it as a warning signal, I will 1,400 neurophysiological responses in your brain and body will completely change and work for you instead of against you. What I have just said is so unbelievably powerful, so I'm going to say it again. Okay? When you embrace any emotion as a warning signal, as a helpful messenger, telling you that you are showing up like this because of something that's going on that you need to pay attention to and deconstruct and reconstruct, in other words, capture and renew, you then make your entire brain and body work for you and not against you. So for example, the blood vessels around your heart will dilate and this will increase the blood flow and oxygen to your brain. And when you have more blood flow and oxygen at the front of your brain, your impulsivity decreases, your decision making increases and you completely start accessing the wisdom that is within you. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Okay, you do that by your, with your mind. As soon as you embrace it, you've done no work yet. All you've done is, okay, I own this. I accept that I am depressed. I own it. And I see that not an, it's, um, um, the depression is a signal. It's telling me something. Then you look at your body. What is your body telling you? Because the memories that you build in your brain, in the thought trees, because a tree is made of branches and roots, and a thought tree is made of branches and roots too. The branches and roots are the memories. So one thought can have thousands and thousands of memories. Okay? So think of just one thought now. Maybe you're thinking of trauma, a traumatic experience that you happen, had happened in your life. So that traumatic experience may be sexual abuse. So the tree is called sexual abuse, the thought tree, but the detail is um, of that actual abuse and how you interpreted that, those are the memories. Do you get the difference? So the memories are inside the thought. So thoughts are made of memories. Memories are all the data. That's what it looks like in you. That's what these things look like in your brain. Okay? So healthy ones look different to toxic ones. Healthy ones, the proteins fold correctly. Toxic ones, the proteins fold incorrectly and are inflamed and chemical imbalance, etc. But that's not your destiny. You can change them because the brain is neuroplastic. So what you see up on the screen now, this is what's happening in your brain at the moment. This is when I say that you use your mind, your thinking, feeling, and choosing, and all that energy stuff to take my words and process them into thought trees in your brain. That's what it looks like. So that's you actually growing trees in your brain if I had to link you up to this technology. And I've slowed it down. It's obviously been slowed down, but that's what it looks like when I say you grow thoughts in your brain. Isn't that amazing? You, you have that power, and then, so that's what, there's another image of this is an actual brain, a human person who's alive, and they're thinking, feeling, and choosing in response to whatever the instruction was. They connect to very fancy technology, and that fire that you see in the brain there is the mind, is thinking, feeling, and choosing moving through the brain. So as you think, feel, and choose, you push this energy through the brain, and as that energy hits the brain, as mind touches brain, there's a response, electrical, chemical, neurophysiological response, and then the, the thoughts start building into your brain. Proteins are made. So that connection of mind to brain creates a physical substance. That's what I mean by you build thoughts, okay? And if it's toxic, they're toxic. If it's healthy, they, they look healthy. So if you're dead, you're not going to have any firing through your brain. So your mind is a difference between dead and being dead and alive, okay? So that's how powerful it is. So now, when, if you are um, not managing your mind, then instead of those 1,400 neurophysiological responses working for you, they work against you. So if I say, oh gosh, I can't deal with this, I can't, I'm, I'm clinically depressed, there's something wrong with my brain, I can't, it's not, it's, it's my brain's broken, I'm, and you start losing your identity and your value, and there's like, you go to a dinner party and you say, I've got clinical depression, everyone's wary of you. Go to the dinner party and say, hey, I just had such a terrible week and I just discovered this and this and this, and I feel so depressed about this. Everyone leans in and says, oh, I'm so sorry, how can we help you? You know, if you share your story, people relate. Am I right? But if you go and tell them that you're brain diseased or you're crazy, <laughs> okay? We're all crazy in a certain sense because we're all a mess, but we can own our mess and we can fix it. We've got to normalize this thing. Only 3% of leaders are talking about this, which means that and only 4% of churches are talking about this. So well done that you've been talking about mental health in your church. Okay, so... 
The mind-brain function that sorts and catalogues your thoughts with their memories gets temporarily shaken up when we don't manage our mind. And it throws everything into a jumbled, distorted picture. So when we don't manage our experiences, everything becomes this jumbled, distorted picture. Mac, if you can bring that, there we go. Okay, that's what I'm saying now. So I'm just trying to give you language to understand what it feels like. Okay, so when this is happening, when we're processing this toxic experience and it's building into our brain, it gets jumbled. Everything is like muddled up in that. The present, past, future, imagination, and we start predicting all these things. I mean, I'm sure you've caught yourself or heard someone that's in a state like this saying the most ridiculously negative things and you think, why are they saying that? But now, here's is very cautious. Don't ever say to a person why. Don't invalidate what they're going through. I'm not saying to you to say that out loud. I'm just giving you the language to understand that people become so almost like you yourself others, etc. when you're in a very toxic state continually, the things that you think about life and yourself are, uh, seem very strange and, and jumbled and odd. And that's because of all this misfiring and miscataloging and, and jumbled up that stuff that's happening in your brain, the tangled thoughts. But they can be unentangled. The important thing is that you never invalidate someone's experience. Never turn, we're going to talk about kids tomorrow night, so I'm not going to talk about that now, but never invalidate a person's experience. If someone comes to you and says this and this and this, and for you it sounds, why are they doing that? Never say that. Never show that on your face. Just understand that the reason it sounds so weird and so negative is because that's what they talking from and it is so you by you making them feel worse by saying oh no that's not something like that to invalidate it that's not so bad this could be worse you know there's all these things we shouldn't say I put up a post about that last week the things that we should never say to people when they tell you what they're feeling I don't care if you don't think it's great the fact that you don't think it's great and it's jumbled up is evidence for you that these people are in a bad state that they're showing up because something's going on so your compassion rises and what you do is you don't invalidate you listen because as you listen, they then can talk, and as they talk, they process, and they start untangling, okay? So it's a different kind of approach. So until you heal, your memories will be muddled and uncatalogued. This is a muddled, uncatalogued memory, this toxic stuff, okay? Past, present, and imagination all get mixed together, and you create predictive patterns in your brain. The longer you do it, the more you will predict. That's why when people aren't managing their thought life and have had years and years of thinking in a certain way, they have then created this predictive pattern in the brain. It's like that trench we were speaking about earlier on, a well-worn path. So you've neurologically wired in a way of thinking, and it feels like it's part of you, and it is, but it's not the original part of you. It's a learned response. So if you've wired it in, guess what? You can wire it out. And it is pretty difficult. I'm not saying it's easy, okay? It's going to be difficult, but you can do it. So it's like a volcano. I showed this earlier on today, and um, I've gone over. Is it still okay to go a little bit more? Are you all still okay? Okay, a few more minutes? Okay. This is a volcano. This is in Iceland. This has just erupted. My son was there just recently. I was there a few years ago with my youngest daughter, and it hadn't erupted. We just were driving over this unerupted, beautiful green field, and the tour guide said, you're driving over an active volcano that could erupt at any moment. I mean, that's the we all. Very, these, are, these are active volcanoes that can erupt at any moment. There's these things under the surface, and eventually, boom, they explode. And the signals are there, the emotional signals, the signals in your body, which is the second one. I haven't told you the other two so I'm going to use this image of the volcano to tell you the other signals. So the emotional ones we've spoken about, depression, anxiety, the other ones are the signals in your body. Is there sickness in your body? Is there an increased heart palpitations? Are you battling to sleep at night? Is, are you waking up with adrenaline rushes? Are you, um, have you got more GI symptoms than normal? Everyone's different. In other words, physical symptoms in your body are telling you a story. They're telling you something. They're telling you at what level of accumulation is, um, is your vulnerability at. In other words, as I said in the beginning, the more we unmanage our, the more we don't manage our minds, the more we weaken our physiology because of that fact that as it goes, mind works through the brain and the body, the brain and body are getting weaker and weaker. They're getting more and more vulnerable to disease. So that for years and years of it, you're going to have more vulnerability, okay? So listen to your body. That's a signal. And then listen to your, to your, to your um, it's, it's emotions, it's your physical. Your, what is your perspective? Are you looking at life? Life sucks. I hate life. This is so hard. I always get this wrong. Um, whatever. What is your perspective? That's a signal. That's, that's not you. That's a signal. 
okay? You embrace it. And then the, then the, the last one is your behaviours. What are you doing? Are you more aggressive than normal? Are you, are you, are you more withdrawn than normal? Do you, are you more on edge than normal? Are you, whatever. What are your behaviours? Are you having more arguments? Is your relationship more strained than normal? What is the pattern in your life? So you use those four signals. I talk about them in the book to start finding out. You, you, to, you use the signals to start tuning in to find out why. Because those signals come from here. And this needs to be fixed. So the signals help you capture the thought. And then once you've captured the thought, you go through the process of, of deconstructing and reconstructing. And that's the neurocycle. It's a five-step process. And very clearly laid out in, in, in my book and in the app. And you do it to, to wire this thing out and to wire in a new habit takes, 20, it takes 63 days, not 21. So we all think it takes 21, it doesn't. It takes 21 to basically find and deconstruct and, and build the small version of this, but it's not going to change your behavior until you actually stabilize this and it takes another 42 days to stabilize it. So to find a toxic, looking at your signals, find your patterns, from there to find the thought behind it and to deconstruct and to build a healthy new thought, which is what you, this is the changing in you stuff that I spoke about, is going to take around about three weeks. But then you've built a new healthy thought, but it's tiny, doesn't have enough energy to impact you. So you've got to give it water the plant, you've got to grow the tree, and that takes another 42 days. And this is where most people fall short. Most people get to that point somewhere in the region of between 14 and 21 days, so they become aware of their issue and aware of what's going wrong, but then they don't know how to manage it, and the awareness actually makes them worse and then they feel stuck, and then it goes round and around and around. And you know what your problem is, but you can't seem to move forward. And very often therapy doesn't take you through proper cycles either. So this knowledge is vital. If you're gonna change as a human, if you're gonna rewire, because every experience is in your brain, in your genes, and in your mind, three places. It takes cycles of 63 days to unwire stuff and to fix up your gene code, okay? And that's something you do with your mind, okay? So this volcano exploding, if we don't deal with it, the volcano will explode. It's exploded in the screen, it's all black. Um, and then it keeps exploding. So this explodes in that depression, that panic attack, and then the increased level, eventually you're so depressed you can't get out of bed, and then your relationships are impacted. It just keeps on refueling, because the, auto -immune, the immune system keeps sending out signals, because you didn't deal with this. If you don't deal with it, the volcano keeps exploding. But if you start embracing through those signals and you start re uh, embracing, processing and reconceptualizing it into this, it happened to you, but you're changing how it's playing out in you. So the trauma happened to you, the sexual abuse, it was terrible, it was wrong in every aspect, but now you have to accept that you can't change that it's happened to you, but you can change how it's controlling you how it's playing out in your future. And that's going to take cycles of 63 days. You do five steps each day for about 15 minutes and you, will, you rewire the brain over those cycles. I've had some patients where they've done multiple cycles over, over two years because there's been so many elements to the trauma that you fix up one thing and you realize there's another and another. And that's okay, there's no cookie cutter timeline on this thing. You know, you, and as you do that, you'll find another one and then there's a new trauma. In other words, it's a lifestyle of renewing the mind that I'm describing. So when a, when a volcano has exploded and it eventually has been sorted out, you embrace, process and reconceptualize, what will happen in Iceland once that volcano has finished exploding is that the lava will then cool down and the minerals from the lava will go into the earth and the earth will now produce a beautiful green pasture. So in other words, there's this new growth, this regrowth. We know the volcano was there, but now there's this new pattern. Do you see what I'm saying? Yes. Okay, so now I'm going to show you um, two, uh, two, two of my subjects in my clinical trial. We're going to look inside the brain and we're going to see um, a head map. And a head map, map, if you can bring up the head map for me. Okay, um, okay there we go. Um, so what you're looking at there, and I put this in my book, um, what you're looking at there are QEEG head maps. So you're looking at a, it's basically a, a scan of the brain, but looking at the frequencies in the brain. So um, as you're listening to me now, if I had to put this technology on you, we, we would see, um, because you're alive and you're thinking and you're listening and you're learning and stuff, we would see all these energy responses in the different parts of your brain. And there's different frequencies. And each frequency is telling us something different. So each, and all the frequencies work together. So the names of the frequency are theta, delta, uh, delta, theta, alpha, beta, high beta, and then you also get gamma. So you don't have to know that. That's just, those are the frequencies you look at. 
It's a bit like um, the, the sea. Think of the sea. If you go far out to sea, you get huge, big swells. That's what we would call the delta wave in the brain. It's a huge, big swell, mainly swelling at night, up at night, and then during the day, we don't want big swells. We want just little ones. If we see big swells of delta during the day, it means you've got a lot of volcanoes waiting to erupt, a lot of undealt with stuff. And so d the high delta during the day impacts, if we see people with high delta during the day, we see that they, there's stuff going on, okay? Um, then the next one, when you come in a little bit, you get the theta wave, which is not as big as those, but it's still pretty big. And then you get, um, then you get the alpha wave, which is, which is kind of a, almost sort of like a, quite a calm, gentle wave, and then it builds into the beta. Beta is your, the, you know, the wave as it builds and it gets the white crest. The white crest would be high beta, and then boom, as it hits the beach, you get lots of little, little waves, and that would be called gamma and then it all goes back and repeats itself again. So what we want is that kind of functioning across the left and the right side of the brain. So people are having a mess and managing the mess. When people are managing their mess, so that the whole thing of it's okay to have a mess and you own it and you repair it and grow, when people are in that kind of cycle, we see a lot of um, a sort of very, we see that wave pattern that I've just described and it kind of looks gray in the brain. It's very difficult to, exp to show it with a, a, a uh, a, a static vision, but we, see, we want to see shades of grey, not the movie shades of grey, okay? We want to see <laughs> shades of grey in the brain. And when we see that, it's going to be unique for everyone. It doesn't look, the, nothing, no brain scan ever looks the same because everyone's different. So the reason I'm going into this detail is because I want to show you evidence of everything I've been saying. So this particular subject came into, into our study, and the study was done over six, six months, but the first 63 days were the critical time periods. And then the, at six months, we checked if things were still happening, if, it was, if this person was still doing well. And so we had a control group, and we had an experimental group. And I'm saying this because it's important to know the control group didn't have any treatment. The experimental group got the treatment. The treatment was the neurocycle in an app. I didn't give them therapy. They didn't get it from me. And I say this to say that I don't have to be in your face. I mean, you can watch me on podcasts and I can be in your face that way, but you don't have to physically come to me for therapy for me to help you. I can't help everyone on the planet as much as I'd like to physically. So I have to, I wanted to see, can I create a, use technology to create a way of reaching people to help them manage their mental health, which is what I've done with my 38 years of research, created the NeuroCycle, adapted, developed, and now we've put this in an app. It's been going for about a year. We're constantly upgrading it. And this is what the subjects got. So the app, my NeuroCycle app is clinically trialed to show that when you manage your mind, you will be 81% more effective or empowered to manage your mind. Listen, 10% in your life will not be the same. 81% is radical. We, we did not in our wildest dreams expect that kind of result. Okay, it was, it was, it was radical. It's a double blind study, random controlled, and I'm saying that if anyone knows anything about science, that's a good way to design a scientific experiment. It wasn't biased. I didn't know who was in what group. I wasn't on the ground floor. I had a team on, at, at the research clinic, etc. So I'm saying that to say I didn't influence this thing. It was all done, run by a research company. I designed it, but I didn't influence the results. Very important, because I I want you to see that this is this is what your mind, how powerful your mind is. This particular subject was ready to pretty much give up and die. They had been diagnosed with clinical depression in the current gold standard way of talking, which, as I've told you, isn't isn't good science at all. They had taken that on as their identity. And when we looked, when we brought them into the clinic, we looked at different aspects. We did brain scans, we did blood work, we looked at DNA functioning. We looked at a lot of psychological tests. I have a specific psychological test that looks at your ability to manage your mind. And the most important, we asked them what their story was. Who are you? What's going on in your life? What's happened in your life? In other words, the narrative. This person's narrative in sum was, I am depression, my life sucks. And this is the last thing. I've been through this, that, this treatment, that medication, nothing works. I'm just here because I'm at the end very, very depressed, not sleeping, not able to function at work, pretty much getting to the point where they were just about to just go and get into bed and never get out of bed again. And that's why we see so much blue. The blue in the brain shows a flat line. Instead of all those waves that I've described, 
we've got flat line, which means very low oxygen, very low blood flow, very low, um, very low interaction. You've got 200 different sections at the top of your brain um, that that are are specialized for you to produce what only you can do. So your design's brain is designed to match your mind. And there's something you can do that no one else on this planet can do. Isn't that amazing? That means that you never have to ever compete with anyone. And if you want to enhance yourself, you need to support others. The more you lift others, the more you increase your own intelligence. That goes completely counter to the world we live in, which is all competitive. So we design for enhancement, not competition. So this person was in a flatline state where they basically were like, there was very little oxygen, blood flow, thinking skills imp um, were not good, low, imp uh, very highly impulsive, very flat, very depressed. Their biological age, the age of their body, which we could see from the DNA. And I spoke about a little bit about this in the first server, so you can watch that online. I don't have time to explain that in depth now, but their body age, the age of their cells and organs, was 35 years older than their actual age. So they were in their mid-30s and their body, they had a, they, their bodies were a body of a sickly 70, 65, 70 year old. If you are in your 30s, but your body is, so, is of a sickly 65, 70 year old, your lifespan is going to be shorter. That's where the statistic of people dying eight to 25 years younger from preventable lifestyle issues comes from, okay? So that's, the, that's her body, her body, it wasn't a her, sorry, that the subject's body was so taxed from all the years of unmanaged trauma that, and just medicating and medicating and never ever getting, no psychiatrist or doctor ever really sat down and said, okay, what's going on? Let's help you embrace, process, and reconceptualize. And I'm stressing this because that is the story of so many thousands of emails that I get and thousands of direct messages and the responses on, on, my, on my social media. And because people are so desperately trying to get set free and the current system of just giving you a label and medication is not gonna help you. You need to be able to process your narrative. You need to recognize that you are amazing, life has happened to you and it's okay and we can clean up the mess. So. That person then got the app loaded, shown how to use it, went away for 21 days and used it every day for 15 to 45 minutes. We had a couple of email contact in between where we did a few psychological assessments online and they came back into clinic at 21 days. Their brain has gone from blue to gray in 21 days. This person went from saying, I am depression and I cannot function to saying, I'm not depression. I am depressed because of and then all the detail, which obviously I'm not gonna share with you, but that is radical. To go from I am depression as my identity, they had no identity. You see a little bit of green at the top there. That show that when we have that kind of energy flow at the front of the brain, it shows that I'm starting to see who I am. I'm starting to value who I am. We see with people that are suicidal, that's blue. Like identity's been very badly affected. People that are, are being told to be something that they're not we will see a drop in, the, in that part of the brain. And that's very dangerous because that is, is, is who you are. If who you are is not valued, why do you want to even be here? You know, we've got to be so careful that we're not doing that to people. And, and there's a lot of ways I can go down this, but I'm not going to. Okay, so this person was, um, also we saw change biologically in them as well. Their DNA was improving. At this point, they had high cortisol, inflammation in their brain and their body, lots of things that were very, very dangerous. Their heart was at risk, their neuro neurology was at risk, etc. By this stage, it was starting to heal beautifully. By this stage, at day 63, nine weeks, at the nine-week point, even more balanced gray, even better identity, beautiful activity showing that they are actually dealing with this stuff. And this over here, this middle part over here, we see this pattern over here shows us that that person, when you get that sort of pattern, the person's developing tremendous insight. The messy mind is connecting with their wise mind. Your wise mind is your wired for love, who you are. You're made in God's image, the core of your humanity. All of us have it. You're using it right now to listen to me. You use it when someone comes to you and says, hey, what should I do? I've got this problem, and you give them advice. We've all got the wise mind, but we don't tune into it enough. And the neurocycle system that I've developed is to help you to tune into it. The neurocycle is simply a word for a system that has been scientifically developed to help you capture a thought and renew your mind. It's so important. It's a lifestyle. Once you get the hang of it, you can use it all day long without even thinking. And you are thinking. I mean, I shouldn't say that. You're always thinking, but you're doing it. You're doing it as a lifestyle. Okay? You're doing it. It's become part of what we call your automatized nature. And that doesn't mean it's unintelligent. Automatization in your is not an intelligence. It's extremely intelligent. So you're being driven in the direct, in the correct way. Okay? So 
This stabilization happened, and I'm stressing this because at six months later it was even more, even better. So this person at this stage was saying, I am not depression. Here I am depression. Here I am not depression, I am depressed because of, but there wasn't yet changes in their behavior. So there was, and this is so important, there was awareness, but no change in behavior. So within a three weeks period of working on stuff, you will become very aware of your problems and why you are like you are or why you're functioning in a certain way. But if you stop there, you will go backwards, okay? You have to move on. So what we, what we no, Mac, just go back to the previous one quickly, please. What, what here we go, so, thank you. Um, so what, what we, in, by day 63, there was behavior change. So by day 63, this person was sleeping 35% more effectively, which is amazing when you're not sleeping at all. Um, this person was back at work. Their relationships were back online. This person was saying things like, okay, I know depression's not a bad thing. Depression's a signal. When I feel depressed, that's okay. I embrace it and I know what to do. That is radically different from that person who came in at day one who was suicidal. So if you look at the next slide, which is the last slide, and I'll wrap up here. Um, this is now one of the subjects in the control group. And what you see over here is all the same brain head maps, but we see lots of red. And red shows there's too much of, remember the waves when they build into, a, and have a crest when they build and they form a crest just before they hit the beach? The white crest is high beta. High beta is for focus, for paying attention, but you can't stay in high beta or you'll buzz, okay? Sometimes people say that I'm in high beta all the time because I'm like buzzing all the time. But you can't because it's too, you have to have a, a high beta and then it has to drop to low, to low beta. And this, um, so when people are very, very anxious and panicking on edge and wound up and uh, that's a lot of high beta going on. And this person at the beginning of the study had a lot of high beta across that area. This over here, that's very full. It's half full, that brain there, lots of suppressed stuff. This over here being so blue, this one over here in the middle, that frequency, um, you don't want it blue, you want it gray. If it's blue, it means that you're not looking inside, you're just suppressing, you're just shoving everything down and you're just pretending nothing's there and you're just moving on and ignoring and that's not a good pattern. So this person started becoming aware through the testing, you could not not because there was so much testing you were doing, but they kept shoving it down. So this just got worse and worse, a big swirling mass and their anxiety um, increased to a point where they got a red brain. This is very dangerous. A red brain is like you are going, like you, don't, you can't even think anymore. Obviously at this point we gave them the app and they stabilized. Okay, that was, that was part of the research and everything. So obviously ethically they got the treatment and everything and they stabilized. But this I show you because you can get aware, but you've got to go beyond awareness. You've got to do the work and it gets worse before it gets better. And I'm going to quickly, I'm going to close with this. I'm going to close with the story of Jesus in the garden. I'm going to leave, whatever you can, Mac, if you can just put up the social media stuff and everything while we, that's my, um, my podcast. If you want to listen, I teach so much about this and then my social media handles. Mac, if you can just put that up. Um, I think it's somewhere, there we go. If you want to follow me on social media, you can just take a screenshot. Okay, Jesus in the garden. I'm not going to do the born again stuff. I'm going to tell you about mental health. Jesus is the most amazing example of mental health. Everything I've said today, I can summarize in the story. So Jesus goes into the garden. When you face your stuff, Jesus is demonstrating for us when we go into the garden that that's how you face your stuff. You can't fix something unless you're aware of it. If you keep suppressing it, you'll get a red brain. So you have to go in the garden to face the stuff. And it's very, very painful to go in the garden. I mean, Jesus in the garden took on every single emotion that we will ever have and every single thing that we could ever have, we can't even begin to understand it with our human brain and our human mind. But what we do know is that that means that Jesus experienced extreme depression and extreme anxiety and extreme everything that we can experience because that's what it says. And we can't understand that, but that's just God. We don't understand God. If you think you understand God, you don't understand anything. But what we do know is that Jesus demonstrated a principle of what we see in neuroscience, which is until you are aware of something and prepared to face it, you are going to be controlled by it. The volcano keeps erupting. You're going to get a red brain. So in order for me to start dealing with this, I have to listen to the signals, which will take me into a level of awareness. In other words, when I listen to the signals, I am walking into the garden. Okay? And I'm now sitting down and saying, okay, I've got to do the hard work of processing what I've got to go through. And I can only go through that. You can't go through it for me. Only Jesus could go to the cross. 
but it's, it's, it's metaphorical for everyone's lives. And Jesus got in that garden and Jesus started trying to build up the strength to face the stuff. And it got worse before it got better. Jesus screamed out to God and said, take this away. So guys, it's okay to say, I can't handle this. Take it away. I hate this. I don't want this. Say it. Get it out. Jesus did it in the garden. And Jesus sweated blood. You see, because Jesus' mind experience was going through Jesus' brain and body. So therefore, Jesus' was physiology, neurophysiology was changing. That capillaries were bursting and Jesus sweated blood. So that's demonstration that your mind affects your brain and your body. It's holistic, okay? So then it got even worse. And then Jesus was really, at that point, turned to the disciples who'd fallen asleep, as we know, and said, didn't ask for Prozac, didn't ask for opioids, didn't ask to swap places, didn't ask anything, didn't say, come here with me. Jesus simply said, can you be with me? In other words, I know you can't do this for me. I know you can't fix me, but I know I need you just to be there for me emotionally. When you say that you need someone, they can't fix you. You can't fix anyone, but we need each other. We need to know, Lay, I don't understand what you're going through. I don't understand that pain. I don't understand the impact of my words on you, but I just want you to know that I'm here with you. And what can I do? What do you need? How can I help you? And let that person share their narrative and let them guide you as to what they need. And then you can give them things like, you can give them, say, okay, why don't you maybe try the neurocycle or whatever. But what Jesus demonstrates there is that you can't do this alone. It's not about you, it's about you in the world. And you need the support of others. But we've got to stop fixing people. People try and fix other people because they're so broken. They think if I fix someone else, it makes me feel good. And we detract from ourselves and our own issues by trying to fix other people. And we get legalistic and follow rules and judge and why aren't you fixed yet? And I told you to do this. Watch that. If if you're doing that pattern in your life, that's a signal that you've got issues that you need to deal with. And all of us have issues that we need to deal with. And then it got worse before it got better. It's very, very normal. If you've suppressed an issue for years and now you're looking at the signals and you're tracing down and you see the detail of your trauma and you haven't ever seen that for maybe 20 years, that is terrible. When, when, a ter- when a child is raped, how do you ever deal with that? That will make you more depressed. That subject who had the blue brain and went to the gray brain, the first one, the one who got the treatment, that person was abused and that person said in over this 21 day period, the first 21 days, they said they actually got more depressed and more anxious and more sad, but it was different. They went from hopeless depression to hopeful depression. What is hopeful depression? What's hopeful anxiety? It's I'm anxious and depressed because of what's happened, but I know what to do. I'm now seeing what happened and it's terribly sad. So it is depressing. And therefore, you can be depressed. David got depressed and sad. You can have emotions. This word of faith movement that doesn't allow you to say anything negative is a lot of nonsense. Okay? You've got to be careful. You've got to express it. Jesus did it in the garden. We have permission there. You can't use God as a genie and scripture as a band-aid. You've got to go through it. And it will get worse before it gets better. So that person said, I feel more depressed, but I know why and I know what to do about it. And that's the difference. And then it gets even worse. It's called the treatment effect. You're gonna get hung on the cross. You're gonna experience pain that will blind you and maybe blindside you and maybe put you in a depression where you can't move for a month or whatever. It's gonna be different for everyone. Where you maybe push people out of your lives because you just can't deal with anything and that's okay because you're in the garden and you're on the cross but you will rise again with the wounds in your hands. And that is your story. That is this change from that into this. And that's why I started out right in the beginning. You cannot change what's happened to you, but you can change what's happened in you. Thank you.